Hi, my name is Jason Yanowitz. I'm the CTO at Signal Digital, which is in the ad tech, martech space. We help brands and agencies maintain identity graphs on their customers. If that means nothing to you, that does not matter. I'm going to abstract that all away. For purposes of this talk, all that matters are graphs. And I'm going to talk about how you maintain billions of graphs at scale without going crazy or uh, eventually get there. Talk is going to, it's actually two talks in one. Uh, the first talk is going to be about how we moved from Cassandra to Aerospike a little over a year ago. I'll talk about why we did that, how we did it, and what we learned uh, in the process. Then a year passes. Uh, now we have new problems, and uh, I'm going to spend the bulk of the talk talking about those new problems and how, now that we've solved our data plane issues, we're able to start making use of some of the current innovations in distributed systems research in terms of doing coordination free computing and staying. Uh, relatively calm in the process. So, Cassandra. It's important to say before I dig into everything that went wrong with Cassandra for us that when we adopted it, which was nine or ten years ago, it was a completely reasonable thing to take on for us. It had all of the properties uh, that we needed at the time, which was something that was free, uh, except for hardware, of course, uh, which becomes a increasingly big, of course, over time, a uh, big caveat. And, um, when we also, when we adopted it, our business was different. We were in the tag management business. This is before Google and Adobe decided to give that away, and we had to pivot into ad tech and martech. And then time passed, and we end up with all of this. I'm not going to go through everything here uh, in detail. This is a litany of sampling of some of the woes we've had with Cassandra and attempts we took to mitigate them. There's three things in particular I want to call out here because they, uh, they're critical for the rest of the story. Uh, the first is we were not actually a good use case for Cassandra once we had pivoted because we were mutating a lot of our data. Uh, I say that because as an engineer I have to provide the caveat that perhaps Cassandra isn't terrible in all situations. Uh, the second thing is that we had moved pretty early on to buffering all of our rights uh, through Kafka, now Kinesis. Um, we we're hosted at AWS. We're in four countries, or four, yeah, four countries. Uh, Ireland, the United States, Tokyo, or Japan, and uh, Australia. And um, buffering those rights through a, 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 a bus turned out to be very helpful during the migration, uh, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And the last thing is, towards the end, we ended up having enough use cases that could uh, handle a read cache that we wrote one. Uh, before that, we just th there was a many years where there, we didn't think there was enough cache uh, coherence that it would, would make sense. And so we did. We rolled out a, a, a cache to try to take some of the load off some of our Cassandra rings. We had seven at one point, uh, each of which had 90 to 100 no nodes in it. Uh, that adds, that's a lot of money, uh, by the way. And uh, the cache worked incredibly well. It let us shrink the rings in some cases, uh, and in other cases, completely eliminate them. So that made us think, well, maybe Cassandra, you know, this thing, if we can cache it, perhaps we're okay. And then we started looking, I started asking around, and the, um, this is shortly when I got to the company. And the cache was written using, the backing store was Aerospikes Community Edition. And so we had the internal conversation about, well, maybe we should just stop using Cassandra completely. We reached out to enterprise support, uh, and uh, they got us in touch with, I'm, I'm sorry, enterprise sales, client support, started having a conversation about how to, uh, client services about how to uh, do that kind of migration. We went back and forth for several weeks. Uh, I don't have enough time to give you all, there's a, that's an entire talk, just the, 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 the journey to get to the point where we could do the migration. But we ended up signing a contract at the end of 2017. We began this project January of last year, and it had three major components to it. The first was we had to change the app that wrote to Cassandra to write to Aerospike, obviously. Uh, the second was, and what was nice was we did have that level of uh, indirection, so we just had to just had to swap out the storage layer with no downtime. Uh, the second thing was we had to become operationally expert with Aerospike. It's one thing if it's your cache and it falls over and you can fail back to the database, but when it's your main store, uh, your SRA team needs to be completely comfortable with it. So that meant right, become learning how to stand up, tear down clusters, change XDR topology backup, restore, uh, set up all the learning, and mon everything you would do to be operationally uh, reasonable. And then the third component uh, was the, for us, the problem, the, the hardest or the scariest piece. And about halfway through the discussions, uh, the planning discussions with Aerospike, we said, you know what, we've never migrated Cassandra to Aerospike. We don't want to become domain experts in doing that. We're pretty sure you know how to do it. Can we just pay you to, to own that piece of the problem? Uh, they said yes, which is good, because it absolutely helped the project succeed. And so we kicked off between January and March. Uh, these three paths went in parallel. And by the time uh, we got to the end of March, we were ready to do the migration. 
The actual mechanics of that were fairly straightforward at that point. We were, were um, we were using EBS, Elastic Block Store, in Amazon, so we could snapshot Cassandra, which is something it's quite good at, actually. Uh, you snapshot Cassandra, you snapshot your file system using AWS tooling, uh, you restore those EBS snapshots on other hardware where you run your migration tool. The tool had the cool name, because I love the Marvel character of Juggernaut. Um, I understand that maybe that name has changed. It's gotten a little enterprisey. I am trying to start a movement to Call it Juggernaut, please. That's what it should be called forever. Uh, <laughs> well, they put me at the front of the room, so now they will pay the price. Um, and then once we had, uh, we, we wrote down the time that we took the snapshot. Let's say it was 8 a.m. on a Monday. Once we had fully uh, done the full migration, we could then stand up our consumers and capture all the rights that have been buffered in Kafka, uh, or Kinesis, actually. And, and then we were in dual write mode. So all read traffic was still going to Cassandra, but all the write traffic was getting applied to these two clusters. And then we tested and tested and tested. Uh, once we were confident that at scale in production, the migration itself had gone well, the systems were working, uh, we, we did a go no go meeting, did the thumbs up, and began moving read traffic one region at a time, and the very next day tore down our Cassandra clusters. Uh, one thing I should mention during this uh, migration, the, the step three there, the running juggernaut took uh, to go f from start to finish took about six days because there was a trillion rows that we had to end up processing through Cassandra, uh, and that takes some time. But the Aerospike cluster was doing 8 million writes a second with a P50 of 10 microseconds and a P99 of less than one milli, which was really nice because that meant we could that crossed out a bunch of stress testing that we were planning on doing prior to going live. We got it for free. So I want to just talk about some of the main lessons we learned from this. I'll talk about the good and the bad. So what went well? I'm not going to go through this whole list. There's three things in particular I want to call out here. Uh, the first is uh, Aerospike put me in touch with some folks who had done similar migrations. And uh, their time was invaluable uh, they, they, for two reasons. One was, uh, and no offense, Jay, but Aerospike sales, uh, they never lied, but it was sounded too good to be true. Uh, and that was, I, I want to be very clear, they, they said, everything they said was at, turned out to be completely true, but I just, I've never had that experience before in industry. And so, <laughs> talking to other, talking to my, you know, colleagues at other companies was very helpful. Uh, the, second, uh, the second thing was there was some, you know, they had lessons of, of things to avoid. In particular, there were some testing scenarios that were tough for them. Um, so that leads to the second thing we did, which was early on we generated two kinds of test uh, data sets. One was synthetic, which we could, it's all garbage data, we could give it to Aerospike and they could play with it on their own. Uh, the second was we took a sampling of actual Cassandra data, stood up some sample, uh, within one of our uh, data centers, stood up a few, a sandbox environment, gave them SSH access and a regression testing tool. So they could run their tool to migrate and then run our tool to see what the skew was between uh, expected and actual state and iterate independently of us, and I think that was a key thing for uh, keeping this timeline moving along, which at the end of the day, given the scale of the project, was pretty great, uh, being about 100 days from start to finish, from co no code written to Cassandra not existing for us. Um, and then the last thing to call out is just the operational savings has been enormous. Uh, there's actually more than just the OpEx savings, though, because the, uh, and the 66% alone would have justified the project, but there's two other things we got. We got a lot more engineering bandwidth back, because by the end of Cassandra, we were putting a lot of of time uh, and heroics into keeping it up, um, which we did, but it was not easy. Uh, and the other thing is, engineering and heroics are not a good combination. That does burn people out, and we definitely burned out a couple of engineers. I, in an initial version of this, I, I, I said we may have burned out a couple of engineers, and multiple people came up to me and said, no, 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 we definitely did. You have to say definitely. So <laughs> there it is. Areas for improvement. Three big areas for improvement. The first two are completely my fault. Uh, and as I describe uh, this first one to you, uh, you would be right to mock me. Uh, and if you don't, I, I, I'm grateful. Uh, and that is, and it made sense at the time. I swear it made sense. <laughs> we focused, I, I was so excited with the performance of Aerospec. I was like, you know, we're going to screw this migration thing up. So if we could just optimize for doing it over and over again, if we get it down to like a day, wouldn't that be great? We'll do it. We'll do some testing. There was a problem. Who cares? We'll throw it away. What have you. So when we got to about 80% correctness with the migration logic, uh, I was like, well, let's focus on performance. And that was, uh, uh, oh, um, 
at the end of the day, the actual migration took six days, and we spent more time than that trying to improve performance. So there you go, a lesson I already knew, and yet I had to relearn. The second thing was the migration had to run two and a half times. The first time we ran it, we pulled the plug after a couple days, because it turns out at scale, um, even though we had done a bunch of sampling of data, Cassandra's even weirder than we realized. Uh, and there were a bunch of corner cases, uh, like three or four that we hadn't accounted for. So we added those to the tool. And when I say we, I mean Aerospike. Uh, added those to the tool, and then we ran it again. Then we got all the way to the end of the migration and started to do testing and discovered that, um, and just to be fair to myself before I just tell you what happened, uh, there was a lot of planning that went into this, and a lot of it went right. I'm just calling out the stuff that, was, that, that should have gone better. Uh, in this case, we'd, I'd, I'd said, hey, let's do a performance optimization based on an incomplete analysis of the way SS tables, which is the storage format for Cassandra, were laid out. And as a result, around one third of the time, well, the upper bound was one third, uh, because we had a replication factor of three for Cassandra, we were regressing some of our data. Uh, and so then we had to make another change that slowed down the migration a bit to that six day period, but then everything was fine. And then the third thing that could have gone better, uh, and we hadn't quite realized how difficult this was going to be. We had an incredibly robust test plan because this was, our business would fail if we screwed this up, right? If we cut over and it turns out we've just destroyed a bunch of customers' data, we have a huge problem. So all kinds of use cases were being covered in the testing. Uh, and that's all well and good, but it turns out that um, if you run a test that an aerospike takes 15 minutes on live production data, but in Cassandra takes nine hours, a lot changes in that data over nine hours. And then trying to compare those results was uh, non-trivial. And uh, what I would do differently in the future is I would have put some senior engineers, embedded them on the test team for that process to help them puzzle through better ways to bisect if the quality of the data is there. Anyhow. Overall, nobody cares about any of that stuff anymore. It's all in the distant past. I'm the only one dredging it up for purposes of this talk. Over the last year, uh, we did have a recurrent issue, though. And that is, uh, and it's a cruel, uh, two sides of a cruel coin. On the one hand, we've accreted complexity in our data model over time. And this is just something that happens to companies as you're moving so quickly and pivoting uh, and the like. And then on the other hand, the data model lacks the expressive power we need for the go forward business. That's a terrible combination. Too complex and it can't do what you need. So we had a problem of like, well, I mean, we've solved our data layer issue. What, what are we going to do next? And the other problem we've got there is we have a lot of other stuff to do. Is it even tractable to, do, to, to, to fix that? So the first thing we did early in February was put together a team of three engineers, one product person, to ask the question within six weeks to do the research to decide the answer of could we systematically simplify and improve our data model this year? Um, Obviously, we concluded yes, otherwise this talk would be over in about 30 seconds. Uh, so I will go through what we learned from that and, and, and how we're going to do it. Uh, before I dig into the design stuff, I should say that we looked at a couple other databases. Our, our model, which is this graph, we have um, many billions of these graphs. There, there's 10 to 50 vertices in each one uh, and some number of edges. Uh, the, um, if you have a graph data model, you would be remiss to not look at some graph databases. We looked at these two, Neptune and Neo4j. Uh, neither of them can, could scale for us in the ways that we needed, would have the operational cost or give us a level of comfort in terms of HA. So we abandoned those. We did also spike on Aerospike, uh, and that's a poor use of poor phrasing, but uh, and turns out it's going to work fine, and I'm going to go through uh, the other parts of this. Two major design learnings. The first is to become more disciplined about event sourcing. As I said, we have been buffering our rights through Kinesis for quite a while, so in some sense you could say those are events. In another more true sense, uh, there is some data in a message, and then there's business logic littered all over the place, and somehow together you have to stitch that to, into what becomes a, ch a change. Uh, so we need to get better about that. And then the other thing was adopting um, CRDTs uh, for our data layer, and I'm going to go through in detail. Uh, I'll spend most of this, the rest of the talk on the on the CRDT part and a little bit on event sourcing. This is pretty standard at this point, all right? I mean, you model any mutation you want to make to data, you model as an event, and you persist it in some sort of immutable log. In our case, Parquet files in S3. Uh, this solves some problems for you, and they're, they're nice problems to solve, right? Data provenance stuff. Where did this data come from? Why does it look the way it does? When did it enter the system? You can do analyses on how does your data change over time, which a typical database is just a snapshot of current state 
there's exceptions to that, Datomic, and you could, of course, model that in different databases. But um, having that, all of those events allows you to do kinds of analyses that uh, are difficult otherwise. And of course, you can do point in time recovery. That's great. These are important things. They're worth doing, and, and we're doing them. However, there's a lot of stuff this doesn't solve for you. In particular, it says nothing about cap. It gives you no way out when you have a partition. Set aside how difficult it is to detect a partition, but once you have and then it's healed, what do you do? Event sourcing is upstream. It doesn't give you any insight into that. It also doesn't help with at least once messaging semantics, which Kinesis has. Um, and then nor, nor does it solve some of the performance issues you're going to have with coordination. We reach into our coordination toolbox because it's a much easier, you know, the lineage is the von Neumann machine mo execution computing model and all the way down to today, uh, we reach to that because it makes sense. Uh, but unfortunately, it also slows us down massively. And the good news is uh, all three of these things are getting addressed uh, in the distributed systems research community and we can start making use of those things. And I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail because I think for us, we're pretty optimistic that this is going to be uh, transformative for us. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with this concept. Uh, this was a conjecture 10 years ago. There's two things that, interesting things that happened in 2009. This conjecture, which is now a theorem, and that uh, the, the, the major uh, paper on CRDTs was published. It's interesting that those are happening as more, the clear limits of Moore's law is showing up and we know that distributed computing, of course, is everything we have these days is the distributed computer, including our laptops. Uh, and what this, what this uh, said was uh, consistency is logical monotonicity. I'm not going to give you the formal definition of logical monotonicity because I will, get, uh, I will run out of time. Uh, I'll give you a, a little bit of a, a, a simple uh, definition. It's a way of layering determinism on top of non-deterministic systems. And you can do it if your program has uh, the property. There's two ways to think about it. One is if you, the more imp if you add to the inputs to the program, your output grows monotonically. That's a little too abstract. A, a clearer way to talk about it would be for any ordering of inputs uh, appearing any number of times, you end up in the same program state, uh, the same output state. Um, and that's a very powerful property. Uh, and it's one that we, we, we spend, a, we don't always get so easily and we spend a lot of time architecting around. This is, uh, th that's one part of what Calm does for you. And the theorem says that uh, the only way you can have a coordination-free computing system, that is one that never, th th that individual actors and it never have to talk to each other and have it be uh, consistent over time is if it's logically monotonic. That's a very strong statement uh, and they've proved it, so cool. Uh, let's make use of it. The other thing that it does for you, and there was a nice paper, summary paper earlier this year that gave you sort of a 10-year wrap-up of, of, of what's happened with this work, um, is that it gives you a nice way to say that there's a boundary. You can have logical monotonicity for, you know, this chunk of your system, 90% of it, and then there's a boundary line and maybe you need some coordination over here and that's okay. You can reason about the semantics on either side of that boundary differently and design differently. So, that's fine. I've just said, to you, I've, I've basically told you, hey, there's a magical thing you can do that solves all of your operational problems. Just go off and do it. Um, the first thing you should ask me is, well, what can I actually solve with this? And here's where I'm going to, what you can solve with this is kind of amazing to me, but full disclaimer, I have not dug super deep. I'm trusting that these peer reviewed papers are not lying to me. I haven't actually worked out the math on this. And that is uh, anything in P time can be solved with a logically monotonic approach, um, as long as you can provide a total ordering for the events uh, in your system. And that's kind of amazing to me. Now, I'm not saying that, you could, the, that you'll be happy with the P space that you're using for, to solve this problem in P time, or that the, P, that, that the number itself is going to be acceptable, but that's a good starting point, um, especially if you pair it with CAP, right? CAP's an impossibility proof. Super valuable impossibility proof in our industry. Uh, very nice, makes it much better to have a conversation between engineering and the rest of the business. Hey, yeah, look, we're going to try not to oversell these widgets, but uh, the fact is it's, it's actually an impossible problem to guarantee that we'll never oversell them. So you guys should come up with a business process for when we uh, screw this up. And uh, that's a nice conversation to be able to have. Um, but CAP is true for the universe of Turing computable problems. That, that is, things that can be computed, CAP applies to. Calm goes the other way, and that's pretty cool. It says, all right, fine, let's carve out. Is there something we can carve out where it doesn't apply? Um, and 
I, I mean, just as a nerd, I think that's cool, but it's also going to make our lives easier. So what does it have to do with CRDTs, which is what I actually told you I was going to talk about? Uh, well, it turns out that CRDTs are logical monotonicity. It's a type of it. Um, and that adds to that be beauty of these two things coming out at around the same time. These are data structures whose operations obey three laws, that they're associative, commutative, and idempotent. There's two main ways to distribute these data structures. There's been a lot of work to add to this, but these are the two main ways. Uh, you can put the entire state of the data structure on the wire, and a downstream processor can pick up two of those data structures and per perform a merge operation that obeys these three rules. Um, or you can ship operations that should be applied to an empty data structure and will build up the state, again, obeying the rules of associativity, commutativity, and idempotence. Um, this is the last time I'm going to say those three words that quickly uh, in this talk. I, we're building an op-based version of this, so that's basically what I'm going to focus on. And if you do this, you have a strongly, eventually consistent system. I don't mean it in a marketing sense. Uh, I mean an actual, mathematically strong sense. You can have two processors, as long as they see the, the, all the events in event stream, it doesn't matter how many times they see the events, the order in which they see them, those two processors never have to talk to each other, and they will have the same state at the end of the day. And if they don't, there's a bug in your code. And not only, which is great, right? <laughs> it's not a bug in the race conditions of the universe. It's in your code, and you're, you're on your way to solving it. So we, we did a design, and we did some talking internally, like, is it worth it? Should we take on the effort of doing this? One of my engineers went home, came back over the weekend. And by the way, pro tip, anytime in an organization you're trying to make change, put the bad stuff on the left-hand side, make it all red. Put the good stuff uh, on the right-hand side, make it all green. Uh, I'm not going to go through what each of these operations is for our business. That doesn't matter. The point is this, you can see the level of pain that we, would, we have today versus what could, what, what could be. So how do we do this? Uh, I'm going to go through, I'm going to build up uh, some intuition about how CRDTs work in practice, then talk about how the, what the specific data structures are that we need, and then how to implement those in Aerospike. Uh, and I'm going to do that all pretty quickly. Cool. Let's start with a grow-only set. This supports two operations. You can add to it, and you can ask if something's in it. Uh, here's an example of a pseudo data structure. I've added a 1 and then a 2. I ask, is the 1 there? Of course it is. Is a 3 there? No. Uh, if I add a 1 again, nothing changes. Uh, it's obvious. I think it's obvious that this, this grow-only set obeys these three rules. If it's not, you can just read my lovely notation down there in uh, QED. Uh, so that's great. Grow only set. There's lots of use cases for these. Uh, it has a small minor limitation that you might not have thought of yet, which is that you can never delete from it. Um, and it turns out that it, it's useful to delete things. Um, data changes over time. Who knew? Cool. How do we delete? Well, let's keep two grow only sets, one that tracks additions and one that tracks deletes. Uh, the next several slides, you're going to see the pseudo data structures are going to be at the bottom of the slide. As we apply, apply operations, we'll build them up. So let's add some stuff. We throw that into the add set. Uh, now let's ask if the two is there. We check deletes. It's empty. So we look in adds. There's a two. So yes, the two is there. Now let's delete the two and then ask if the two is there. We check deletes. There's a two. We short circuit and say, nope. The two is not present anymore. It's not visible uh, in this set. Cool. Now let's add the two back in. And of course, nothing changes because it's idempotent. Uh, and uh, we have a problem, which is it's a delete one set, which I'm sure there are use cases for. Uh, I don't have one, uh, but seems like, you know, OK, cool. What do we do about this? What's going wrong here, right? Why are these values latching? Uh, and it is, it's because we haven't captured that causality. We haven't figured out. We, we, we need a partial ordering of events that happens before. And when you hear happens before in distributed systems, you should think vector clocks. Uh, that would be one way to solve this. Um, th but they're kind of an operational hassle, so we're not going to do those. We're going to cheat, uh, and we're going to do a cheat that lots of people do. And so we're, uh, you know, Let's do it. And that is, we're going to use time to provide ordering. But we're not going to be totally cavalier about it. Uh, we're in AWS. AWS, 18 months ago, rolled out a really useful service called TimeSync. It's, I, I don't know if it's the only, but it's one of the few. It's the only one I could think of that, that's an AWS service that's free. Um, 
They put an atomic clock in every data center. They locked it to GPS. So within the limits of relativity, all the clocks in all of their regions uh, are in sync. And then on, our, on all of our machines, we rolled out Crony, which is a replacement for NTPD. It has two very useful properties. The first is it guarantees time is monotonically increasing on a system. Um, if you recall, I'm trying to build a logically monotonic system. So seems like a good property to have. Uh, if, there's, if there's error um, when it checks the reference, uh, the atomic clock, it will either slow or speed up the clock ever so slightly to correct for the error. Uh, the other thing, uh, uh, and also like with leaps, I think time sync itself does leap second smearing, but it doesn't matter because Crony would give that to you. The other thing it does is it tells you how much error there is, what it's seen for error between it and the atomic clock. And then you can use that to see how much skew you have across your fleet. In our case, it's 200 microseconds. Good news, uh, for our business problems, 200 microseconds is fine. We will not have a clashing events uh, that happen at a resolution faster than that. Even if my engineers make their code super fast, we still won't have that problem. Uh, and that's, that's good to do. So let's change the interface, because now we're banning, the, by using time, we're saying things can't move backwards in time, and we'll be fine. So add and delete now take a time component, um, and we leave present the same. We could add a time component there if we wanted to keep a lot more bookkeeping behind the scenes, but we don't have a use case for that, so we're not going to. So now let's go back to the delete problem. We now create what's called a last right win set, a CRDT set. And we add the, the time component. And again, we're going to start with empty data structures. These are now maps. You can tell because the braces that were exactly braces before are now map braces. Um, it's this very subtle difference, but it's there. Um, we add a one and a two with timestamps. And now the keys represent set membership and the values represent the last message we saw. So if we ask if the two's there, there's nothing in deletes, there's a two in adds. So yes, the two is there. Cool, everything's awesome. Okay, now we get a message to add one um, with a timestamp of 100. We check our add structure, it says 103. That's, uh, that's more recent than the 100, so this is a time traveling message which we will not allow. We drop it on the floor. If we do a delete, we can add a two and with a 102 timestamp to the deletes message. If we ask if the two is there, uh, it's still there because when we do a compare between the adds and deletes, uh, 103 is obviously more recent. So it's currently visible in the set. Um, and that's, that's how you implement a last right win set with CRDTs. That's what we can do. Um, except I'm lying to you a little bit. For our particular use case, we can do a little bit better than that. Instead of maintaining two separate uh, maps like that, we can condense it all. Um, so we can have, again, the keys will be uh, set members, but now we'll have a tuple for the value of the last message we saw on whether it was an add or a delete. I haven't changed the interface to the data structure, so assuming that uh, that's a pretty good sign that I'm not lying to you uh, about the, the, the viability of this, but I'll just give you a quick sense of what this would look like. You add a couple things. When you ask if the two's there, you check to see if it's in the map and if it's currently visible. If you delete it, obviously it's no longer visible. Cool. So this is much closer to what we're going to do in Aerospike. But how does this solve our problem of graphs at scale? Well, a graph is just a set of vertices and a set of edges. Uh, so now that we can do sets of CRDTs, uh, we're all set to go here. Um, the, an edge for us is going to be a tuple of two vertex IDs that indicate the join. Um, and a vertex is an ID and some data. Uh, I'm going to abstract past what the data is because who cares right now. Uh, how to do this in Aerospike. Uh, we're going to have a namespace called vertices. At the bottom of these slides, I'm going to build up the bins that exist on the record. The first one is going to be our IDs. For us, this is a tuple. It can be whatever you want. And we're also going to put this into a bin so that if we're looking at a record, we know what, the, what, what, what value it is. And then we're going to take that tuple of timestamp and visibility, and let's just compress that into a single uh, long that is uh, the first 63 bits of which represent nano since epoch. Last bit is whether it's visible. You don't have to do it this way. You could declare your own epoch, use less bits, give yourself more bookkeeping bits. But this is what we're going to do. This is, what, this is good enough for us. Um, so now we have this V time at the bottom uh, as another bin. If we stopped here, this is a last right, the entire namespace of vertices represents a last right win set um, in, in, in its totality. Um, as a data structure, it has a limitation, which is it's a completely disconnected graph, and I cannot think of a use case for that. So we do need to have edges as well. Um, there's different ways we could do this. Uh, we could have a separate namespace. For, 
a set of reasons having to do with our specific use cases, we actually want to put the edges on the record. Um, so we're going to do a last right wind set. And all we have to keep track of is the other vertex IDs, right? Because we're on our, we, we know we're on this vertex, so we just need to know what else we're connected to. And that's its own last right wind set. And then the last thing we're going to do, because we're being nice to ourselves, uh, future Jason will thank today Jason, is we're going to, every time we see an event uh, that touches this record, we'll take the event ID that also exists in our immutable event store and put it on the record. Now, when we ETL this database, we can join it against our event store and make sure everything makes sense. And when it doesn't, we know it's our fault, right? There's a bug in the system somewhere and we can go find it. Cool. So that's how you lay it out. That's how you lay out these records. But we still have the problem of how we do the writes because um, there's a little bit of a complication here, which is when I was going through all of that, well, we look at the 103 versus the 104 timestamp, and we could do, I'm doing a compare and set. Um, and that requires some, we can't just pull those records back to our application and do it because there's a race condition. Someone else could be updating that same record in Aerospike. So it has to happen server side. But that's okay for two reasons. Uh, the first is, um, the entire approach, this calm design approach, says that's fine. You can, put, you can have your system semantics that are, that are logically monotonic up to a barrier and then do something different on the other side, uh, which is what we're going to do, push that coordination to the smallest bound. And the really good news is Aerospike essentially gives this to us for free because record uh, updates to individual records are guaranteed to, be a, guaranteed to be atomic. So now we just have to do this compare and set operation server side. And the obvious way to do that, which is the one we thought of because it's obvious, is to use a UDS. Uh, the problem with the UDF is that now you have to, you need a test and deploy story and some other stuff. Um, so we were talking to Tim Fox uh, from Client Services and he had a much better idea. Um, it does require a new version of Aerospike, which I think we're going to get soon, but we'll see, uh, which is going to allow for nested operations on complex data types. And now what we do is, because we've constructed these V times uh, the way we have, we can keep a sorted list of length one and just we, we can add to the list and trim to the highest value uh, and we're guaranteed to get the semantics that we want. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, now we've implemented CRDTs at scale in Aerospike and um, everybody, everything is awesome. Uh, except, of course, for uh, one issue, which is that we will be deleting lots of things over time and at some point, uh, that's a lot of garbage to have around, so you need some way to do GC. That's cool too. We've got a, we've got a plan for that, and that is that we can um, purge stuff by making a rule. And again, I'm going to lean on the, 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 some of the design suggestions from the Calm paper. Just pick a quiesce time, and this is a business rule. If something's been deleted for, I, I, we, I have three days on here, maybe we'll make it five, certainly a long weekend, and nothing uh, has touched it. So you, um, at that point, it can be GC'd, it can be reaped, um, and, you, and, and you'll be fine. So I, but of course, you now have the problem of well, what needs to be GC'd? How do you, how do you find that? Um, there's a few different approaches to doing that. Um, one is you can scan the database in place. Uh, the other that we're going to do, another, I should say, there's others, but the, the one that we're going to do is we're going to be ETLing Put, getting very good at operationally having a, uh, uh, an extract, an ETL of our database in the warehouse. So we can do queries there to emit events. And I do want to say, don't just go in and mutate your Aerospike database. That's, that's the devil's work. That's evil. Emit events, right? That's the whole point of building the system. So you have a new kind of event called GC, or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, naming is hard. And uh, those events can flow all the way through your system. And when they get picked up by the Aerospike processor, they can get applied there. There's one caveat here, which is you should make sure that the V time on the GC event still matches what's on the record. That way you know it's not a stale GC. Otherwise, you drop it on the floor, and everything is fine. So there's, there you have it in a nutshell. This is a system that we're building right now. Um, we're in phase one of that, which is to stand this up. We're going to stand up this entire pipeline. We're going to tee our events at the edge of our network. Um, oh, I should say, uh, one nice thing about our IDs is we know what they are right at the edge. We don't have to do any lookups anywhere, and then they can just flow all the way through our system. Uh, we can get immediate business value from this, as, which is good, because uh, there's a lot of engineering value, obviously, from standing up a separate parallel pipeline that allows you to prove at scale that this approach is going to work, but we have business value. And then over the course of the year, we're going to add more and more capabilities to this until we eventually throw away the existing pipeline. This is, uh, I think the pattern for this is creepily and 
enough called the strangler pattern, because uh, anyway, uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, and none of that would be possible if we hadn't solved our data plane woes last year. So there's three groups of folks I really need to thank for this. Uh, one is the signal engineers. They're doing all the work. I'm just standing up here acting like I'm doing it and taking credit for it. Uh, the second is Aerospike uh, has been an incredible partner in this. They've been, their client services, support, engineering have all been very helpful in helping us think this stuff through. And the third is the distributed systems research community whose ideas I'm, I hope I'm correctly stealing. Um, well, if not, I'll tell you when we're at scale. Um, so. That's it. Um, any questions, disagreements, comments? Quick question, Jason. Yes, Tim. Talk about terms of throughput and scaling. What, what, you know, what sort of latencies are you expecting off this, the, the CRDTs? Ah, great question. So the question is, what kind of latencies are we expecting with the CRDTs and the throughput and the scaling? Um, I think in my effort to trim this talk down, I left out some of those key engineering considerations. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 10 events a second, no, uh, we're doing, um, uh, at the edge, we should see, we'll peak out, uh, it's not that high, it's like uh, 10, 15 to 20,000 uh, events per second. There's a little bit of a right amplification that'll happen in aerospike, so the most we'll have there will be um, 40,000 a second, I think. Um, and obviously Aerospike can handle that no problem. The latency requirements are reasonable for this use case. Uh, we can handle, uh, it's okay if it takes a second for it to make, make it all the way through the pipeline. Uh, that, we won't even notice that. Um, and then, oh, what's the other part of that? And I already said the cardinality of our data. So the other thing, um, the, in, uh, the, we're using Aerospike V4 for this. First of all, so that Meher doesn't kill us for not being on V4, but also because it has um, all flash. We can, we can have a much larger cardinality without having to have the RAM footprint to hold the whole red black tree, all the, all the uh, forest in memory. And uh, for us, we don't mind the latency hit of, of having those indices on uh, disk. So we're gonna make use of that. There's also obviously strong uh, 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 consistency, but, and then this awesome nested, uh, operations on uh, nested, uh, on CDTs that's coming. How was that for an unbelievably wordy answer to your question? <laughs> Matt. So, uh, what's the lifetime of those uh, The question is, what are the lifetime, what is the lifetime of those objects? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it, there's different business rules. So, some of those are a year. Some of them, the gra some of the vertices in a graph uh, can be there for a year. Um, Sorry, they can be there for longer than a year. They can have an M time that's uh, up to a year long. So they can keep getting refreshed and they could be there for years. Uh, some are getting expired. Uh, some of them, like our trade desk IDs, for example, uh, have a much shorter uh, time frame. Uh, in fact, I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> um, but so, so some of the stuff could be getting evicted on the order of days or, or um, we don't have any, we don't mind if we have data there that's, uh, has a t that lives for longer. It can be stale uh, and it's not going to cause any business problems for us. Just OPEX. No disagreements? This is, <laughs> nobody thinks this is a terrible idea? Someone, please stop us before we do something crazy. And by the way, if you've implemented this already, please come talk to me because I, wa I, I want to you know, steal all your knowledge. I mean, collaboratively make use of all your knowledge. <laughs> so. Okay, is that it? Cool, should we call it? Yeah.